This is Mrs. Palmer Quay with the first video for Module 10. In this video, I'm going to talk a little bit about the characteristics of acids and bases and two ways that we define what is an acid and what is a base. Acids and bases are chemicals that have particular properties, and generally we talk about them as having properties in aqueous solutions. They are found in many familiar substances, some of which we eat and some which we clean with. So how do acids and bases compare? Well, they are both electrolytes. They both will make ions in solution, and that means that acids and bases can both conduct electricity. Some conduct electricity very well, and some are only weak conductors, depending upon how strong the acid or base is. Acids taste sour, and we enjoy eating acids not only in sour-tasting candies, but also in that sort of zippy taste that we get in many fruits. Bases taste bitter, and we really don't eat a lot of foods with bases in them. Acids will turn a particular indicator known as litmus red, where bases turn litmus blue. And there are several different indicators that we'll be using in lab. They are chemicals that will change color when the pH changes, and they can be very helpful in chemical reactions. Acids also react with certain metals to produce hydrogen gas. Bases don't have a similar reaction with metals, but they can feel slippery to the touch because what is actually happening is that the base is reacting with a little bit of acid on your skin and making a tiny, tiny bit of soap. Acids can be neutralized with a base, and bases can be neutralized with an acid. So basically combining the two, you can cancel them out. And last, acids have a pH below 7, and bases have a pH above 7. So here are some, a very blurry picture, I'm sorry, of some common acid and basic compounds. Things that are quite acidic are like the hydrochloric acid that is found in your stomach to help digest your protein. Not quite so acidy, but I, I'm sure you can imagine that having a lot of this substance would not be very pleasant, are things like lemon juice or vinegar. In the more neutral area here, right around 7, we have distilled water, which has an absolute uh, 7, exact 7 pH, but milk is fairly close to 7, and blood is kept very close to 7. The pH of your blood does not change very much because of the processes in your body are very dependent on pH. And then most of the common substances that are on the base side or the alkaline side of the pH scale are things we use to clean with. Soap and other detergents, ammonia, and then lye or drain cleaner is the most basic, and it is just as dangerous as the very, very acidic hydrochloric acid on the other side. So either end of the pH scale is dangerous to living things. So why do acids and bases do what they do? What is it about them chemically that make them have these properties? Well, the first person to try to get a handle on this was the Swedish chemist Arrhenius, and Arrhenius proposed that acids are substances that release hydrogen ions, just that hydrogen proton, and bases release the hydroxide ion. Arrhenius acids then are formed by highly polar covalent bonds because the um, electron of the hydrogen then is being pulled away from that, leaving just a hydrogen hanging proton, basically hanging on by the skin of its electrons, to whatever compound it's compared to, such as hydro hydrogen with chlorine. If you remember, the um, electron is really being pulled towards that chlorine atom because of the strong electronegativity, and so this is very positive and very negative. It's a polar molecule, and this actually is so positive that it, it's not that hard under the right conditions to actually get it to leave and create a hydrogen proton. So hydrogen chloride or hydrochloric acid releases those hydrogen ions when they're in aqueous solution in water. Arrhenius bases have to contain the hydroxide ion to make the definition, because the definition is that they reduce, or release, sorry, hydroxide ions. So we have things like sodium hydroxide, which is lye, or potassium hydroxide. All of your metal hydroxides are Arrhenius bases. 
The reaction of an arrhenius base with an arrhenius acid with an arrhenius base produces an ionic compound, which the old-fashioned word for that is salt, and water. So here if we have hydrochloric acid, or as our arrhenius acid, reacting with sodium hydroxide, our arrhenius base, it makes water and sodium chloride. Right, as soon as you do the reaction, of course, this will actually be sodium ions and um, chlorine or chloride ions in solution because it's in water, but you could evaporate the water and leave the sodium chloride, leave the salt behind. But not all things that act like acids and bases, following those properties that were listed several slides ago, actually will follow this pattern. They don't all make a salt and water when mixed together. They don't all donate a hydroxide ion. So we needed to change this definition, or scientists knew they needed to broaden it a little bit and move beyond just hydrogen and hydroxide ions. So a broader definition was proposed by two scientists, basically concurrently, the Danish chemist Johannes Bronsted and the English chemist Thomas Lowry. And so we have the Bronsted-Lowry definition. And in the Bronsted-Lowry definition of acids, will they donate a hydrogen ion, just like we saw with Herrhenius acids? But the base is what accepts that hydrogen ion. So we don't have to worry about having a hydroxide ion present. You just need a substance that will accept a hydrogen ion, and that becomes a Bronsted-Lowry base. As a result, you form these conjugate pairs that are related by losing or gaining this hydrogen ion. And this particular acid-base reaction of Bronsted-Lowry acids and bases may not resolve into a salt plus water like we see with our Arrhenius reactions. If the reaction is moving forward in this direct direction, like we've got water here combining with ammonia, giving us an ammonium ion and a hydroxide ion. And the water serves as a acid when the reaction is going forward. But if we were going to make the acid, the reaction move in reverse, then that hydroxide ion that had come from the water would actually be accepting a hydrogen proton, hydrogen ion, to go back to becoming H2O. So with Bron Bronsted-Lowry conjugate pairs, the substance that serves as an, ac an acid in the forward reaction becomes a base in the reverse reaction, and the opposite is true. The substance ammonia, in this case, that serves as the base, it accepts the hydrogen ion to become an ammonium ion, but if we reverse this reaction, it would give up that uh, ammonium give up the hydrogen ion and turn the ammonium back into ammonia. And so along with the idea of the Bronsted-Lowry definition, you have this idea that reactions can go both forwards and backwards, and something that is an acid one way can be a base when the reaction's moving in the other direction. So the Arrhenius definition for acids and bases can be thought of as being a subset of the Bronsted-Lowry definition of acids and bases, because every acid that's an Arrhenius acid or an Arrhenius base is also a Bronsted-Lowry acid or base. But there are some substances that act like acids and bases that do not have hydroxide ions, do not act like an Arrhenius definition of an acid and base. Arrhenius acids also exist in aqueous solutions as part of the definition, whereas Bronsted-Lowry acids and bases can exist without water. There actually is a third level of definition that's even more broad, more general, and this is the Lewis acid and base definition, which isn't even mentioned in your book. Bronsted-Lowry is called covalent acids and bases. Arrhenius acids and bases are just presented as acids and bases. So these are words that are not used in your textbook, but I think you'll recognize the type of reaction have going on after you have read the text. But a Lewis acid and base have the definition that a Lewis acid accepts an electron pair to form a covalent bond, and a Lewis base donates an electron pair. But we won't be dealing with Lewis acids and bases in this class. And finally, we need to talk about substances that are monoprotic or polyprotic or maybe even amphiprotic. Mono, I'm sure you recognize mono meaning one and poly meaning many. Mono and poly refers to how many 
hydrogen ions can be donated or accepted. So phosphoric acid here, H3PO4, actually is a polyprotic acid because it can donate one hydrogen and create this ion, H2PO4, negative one. If that ion donates another acid, if the situation is right, it will create a ion HPO4 with a negative two charge. And then that also can one more time donate the hydrogen to create just the phosphate ion with a negative three charge. So acids with more than one hydrogen listed in the uh, chemical formula are most likely polyprotic acids. Amphiprotic substances can act as a base or an acid, and water is probably the most common of this. Those substances that act as buffers, such as the um, hydrogen carbonate or the bicarbonate ion in your bloodstream, those are also very important for living things. So so in these reactions, we see water first acting as a base, reacting with hydrochloric acid to produce a chloride ion, and the hydronium ion, you can see that the hydrogen has been added to water here because we've got one extra positive charge. And if water is reacted with ammonia, NH3, then in this case it gives up it's hydrogen, it acts as a base, so that we can form the ammonium ion and the hydroxide ion. And this finishes up what I wanted to say in this first introduction to acids and bases.